On several occasions, Pope Francis has said, a society that does not respect history or that doesn't have respect for its elders is dead. This is because we learn lessons of life from history. So we have introduced a little program for you, our followers, our friends and fellow Jesuits, which we have entitled Jesuit Historical Issues, focusing on the Jesuit province of Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Now to get us started on this program, we've asked Father Brian Enright inside Garnet House, and he's the archivist, to take us through a little bit of a history on how the earliest missions started. So let's get inside Garnet House and hear from him. The first phase really starts in the year 1560, when Father Silvira, a Portuguese Jesuit working in India, came to this country and travelled up the Zambezi to the court of the Munamatapa. Initially he was well received and he baptised the Munamatapa and his mother, but then the Munamatapa, probably influenced by Arab traders, turned against Silvara, who was martyred on the 16th of March 1561 and his body was thrown into the Musengezi. Further attempts at missionary work were made by the Dominicans in the 16th century and the Jesuits in the 17th century. But little was achieved and all came to an end in the year 1775. So that would be the first phase. It is said that three sons, a total of three sons, were taken by the Dominicans to, the Indi to India and began their training as priests. One ended up as a doctor of theology, teaching in Goa, I think it was, where he died and is buried. Another died on the voyage. A third died, remarkably, in Brazil. So we have a few things and I organized them according to the phases I was talking about. Right. We have a life of Gonzalo Silvara uh -huh. by Father Ray, who used to teach at the university here. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a lot on that early, those early days in Bauer's book on Christianity in Africa. Uh -huh. He says 2,000 years of Christianity in Africa, mm. in African history quite an achievement. I think you might find in there mm -hmm. mention of the Munumatapa's sons who became priests. All right. Mm -hmm. They were certainly the first indigenous Catholic priests in the country. In the country. From the, from the country. From the country, okay. They never came back. Mm -hmm. The second phase would be in the beginning in the 19th century. It begins really in the year 1879 when Father de Pelchin, a Belgian Jesuit, led ten companions on the Zambezi mission. Travelling up from Grahamstown in South Africa, they reached Tati on the 16th of April, where they waited for permission to proceed to Bulawayo to meet Lobangula. Tati is now in Botswana. It was thought to be a suitable centre from which to launch the future mission. And there was a Jesuit mission at Tati from 1879 to 1885. The present Bishop of Francis Town is developing a shrine to commemorate that residence at Tati. Father David Harold Barry has been there at least two, on two or more occasions, yes. There is a historian archeologist who used to teach at St. George's and Peterhouse, who did a lot of research and found the graves. Two Jesuits died at Tati and are buried, and he found the graves. So the Jesuits actually reached Bulawayo on the 2nd of September, 1879, where they were welcomed by Lubangula. They were allowed to open a house, but not permitted to make converts. So they left Bulawayo in 1885, only to return 10 years later in 1895. The ruins of that first house can still be seen near Old Bulawayo. It's a national monument and the Archdiocese of Bulawayo makes an annual pilgrimage to the site. There were two further expeditions. In 1879, Father Law led a group northeast to Omzila's Crawl, but he died there and nothing was achieved. Father Law 
was buried originally at Mzila's crawl, but the body was later moved, found and moved by Father Prestige, taken to Chishawasha, where it occupies a prominent grave in the cemetery there. So the following year, that would be 1880, Father de Pelchin led another group northwest towards Wangi and the falls. And a mission station was opened at Pandamatenga, only to be closed five years later, in 1885. Today, Pandamatenga is in the Diocese of Wange, and the bishop has opened a shrine to mark the site. At the time of the Zambezi mission, people wrote letters, and we have got most of those letters, the originals here, Mm-hmm. But they've been published, in fact, first of all by Professor Gelfand. All right. And then a better edition, a more up-to-date mission edition, was produced more recently. All right. Journey to Gubulawayo. Uh-huh. And the journeys beyond Gubulawayo. That would be right. Omzila's Crawl and uh-huh. Pandamatenga. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this speaks about Mpandeni. And... Really marking the end of that phase would be the pamphlet brought out f- to mark the centenary of M. Pandani. Uh-huh. It says 87, in fact it was 86, 86 that the first okay. people got there. Mm-hmm. But the mission of course has developed yeah, beyond, beyond recognition. That, yes, M. Pandani, 1886 it said, <coughs> but not 87. Meanwhile, back in Bulawayo, Father Prestige eventually persuaded Lobangula to allow him to open a mission, and the king gave him Mpandeni. So a mission was opened at Mpandeni in 1886, but it closed in 1889, only to reopen in 1895. So Mpandeni is the first Catholic mission in Matabili land. In 1883, Father Weld replaced Father de Pelchin as superior of the Zambezi mission. And faced with the difficulties encountered by the first missionaries, the sickness and the many deaths, 18 Jesuits died in the space of five years. He decided on a strategic withdrawal to South Africa. He planned to set up houses of formation to train young Jesuits for the mission. Candidates would come out from Europe and do their novitiate and study philosophy and theology in South Africa at Dumbrody. But these initiatives were short-lived. They were overtaken by events. Father Alphonse Daigneau, French-Canadian, replaced Father Weld as superior of the mission on the 13th of December, 1887. And he saw in the Pioneer Column an opportunity for returning to Zimbabwe. So he arranged for a Jesuit chaplain to the column and he also obtained the services of Dominican sisters to work in the mission. Father Prestige overlaps and he was out of the country for something like three three or four months only. So I mean there's a certain continuity but also a fairly clear break. All those houses as I mentioned which had been opened were in fact closed before the pioneer column came up. Chishawasha uh-huh. We, uh, there's a nice list of the first Jesuits who came out here. Uh-huh. Father Rickarts was superior from yeah. 92 to 1905, uh-huh. and then for another 10 years, 1910 to 1920, 1920. Uh-huh. and he died a few years later. Mm-hmm. But the rest, there was one other priest and then a team of brothers. In those early days, the brothers were the the whole thing depended on the brothers because okay. they did all the building, mm-hmm. all the farming. Right. <coughs> there are two booklets brought out for Chishawasha, the 70th anniversary. Uh-huh. That was Father Ray again. And then for the centenary, Father O'Donovan brought uh, out this another is one. This a popular one, I think. Most people have seen this one because it features the Chishawasha Mission Church. The picture is very, <laughs> yes, very well known. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. And this one? This is quite. This is very interesting because Lawrence Van Bay, mm-hmm. who died quite recently, well over a hundred years old in London, uh-huh. um, grew up on Chishawasha, and this book 
tries to, well, it does. It, I mean, it's a history of um, the, the country before the pioneer column, right. during and after, mm -hmm. and the damage caused by the pioneer column, of course. Oh, right. But there are quite a few references to the Jesuits who he knew at Cheshire Washer. Mm -hmm. He spent three years at the seminary, in fact, before changing career uh -huh. and becoming a journalist mm -hmm. and writer. All right. Mm -hmm. But um, if you want to get people's reaction to the missionaries, this is the book to read. That's quite a good. And ill fated people, that's the title of the book. It was in 1890 that the Pioneer Column reached Fort Salisbury. And the chaplain was a German Jesuit, Father Hartmann. He was soon followed by Father Prestige and five Dominican sisters. Very soon afterwards, Father Francis Rickarts and six other Jesuits arrived in Chishawasha, an estate given to the Jesuits by Cecil Rhodes. They arrived there on the 30th of July, 1892. So Chishawasha is the first Catholic mission in Mashonaland. That's Father Rickarts, yes. He was the founder of Chishawasha. He was superior there on two occasions he spent most of his life there, in fact, so he's certainly the founder. And as you go into the cemetery, there's a big cross straight ahead, and he's buried at the foot of that cross. He gives his name to our retirement home, Rickart's house, yes. The years that followed saw a considerable expansion as parishes and missions were founded and developed all over the country. Early foundations include 1891, Salisbury, 92, Fort Victoria, now Machingo, 95, Bulawayo, 96, Trias Hill, 98, Gokomere, 99, Mutare, 1900, Gweru. So there we have it, our viewers, our collaborators, our friends, and those who follow us on WhatsApp, Facebook, or any other social media platform. That's been the beginnings of the history of the Society of Jesus in Zimbabwe and of course not excluding Mozambique which we shall try and feature as well. <laughs>